In 1962, Los Angeles took the unheard of step of banning a train, not for safety, but for being too loud to live near. Union Pacific's answer to freight demands was a locomotive powered by jet engines, screaming through neighborhoods with 8,500 horsepower, louder than a jet at takeoff, and strong enough to melt asphalt and silent city council chambers. Why did engineers risk civic outrage chasing this power? And how did a single train force cities to rewrite their laws? The real story begins with a crisis no railroad could ignore. March 1962. Los Angeles City Council chambers filled with residents who had not slept in days. The complaints came in waves, letters, phone calls, even midnight visits to council members' homes. The source was impossible to ignore, Union Pacific's gas turbine locomotive, a machine louder than any train before it. The council's minutes record testimony from a councilman whose district straddled the main line. He declared, we are not running an airport through the heart of my district, to scattered applause. Neighbors described a sound that rattled windows and vibrated walls, a roar that rolled in long before the train itself appeared. One woman told the council that the noise is a continuous torment. For four months, the turbine's trial runs had turned entire neighborhoods upside down. The city's public health office logged dozens of complaints about lost sleep and frayed nerves. Real estate agents reported buyers backing out of home sales along the tracks. Local newspapers ran headlines calling the train an industrial menace. The council's legal advisors pored over nuisance ordinances, searching for a precedent. There was not one. No other city had ever banned a train for noise alone. On April 24th, after a heated debate, the council voted. The ban passed by a wide margin. The order was direct. Union Pacific's turbines were forbidden from operating within city limits. Within days, other California cities followed, each passing their own restrictions. Union Pacific's response was swift, but resigned. The railroad promised technical fixes, but the turbines disappeared from Los Angeles rails almost overnight. For city officials and residents, the message was unmistakable. No amount of horsepower could drown out the demands of a city unwilling to tolerate the cost. The railroad's search for power would have to continue elsewhere. Union Pacific's operations managers faced a blunt reality as the 1950s drew to a close. The big boy steam locomotives, each capable of 7,000 horsepower, were aging out of service. Their replacements, diesel electric locomotives, promised reliability, but fell far short in muscle. A typical diesel unit of the era mustered only 1,500 horsepower. To haul the same tonnage across the mountain grades and endless plains, it took four or five diesels lashed together, burning through fuel and maintenance hours with every trip. Freight demand showed no signs of slowing. The Western main lines remained the backbone of Union Pacific's business, with mile-long trains loaded heavy from Council Bluffs to Ogden. Operations planners combed through motive power logs, running the numbers on every available solution. The calculations were unforgiving. No single locomotive in production could match the big boy's brute force, let alone exceed it. Multiple unit diesels meant more crews, more breakdowns, and more delays. Every slow climb or stalled consist risked lost contracts and profit. Pressure mounted inside the railroad's Omaha headquarters. The board wanted a machine that could pull the longest trains at speed with fewer moving parts and less human intervention. The answer had to be something new, something that would close the horsepower gap in a single, self-contained package. As the old steam giant steamed off into retirement, the search for a replacement grew urgent. Operations managers pressed General Electric for ideas that could deliver not just incremental improvement, but a leap in power. The stage was set for a radical departure from tradition and a willingness to gamble on technology that had never before been tried on American rails. General Electric's locomotive division was never known for small ideas, but the challenge Union Pacific brought in the late 1940s 
was on another scale entirely. The railroad wanted a single machine that could outmuscle a fleet of diesels, something with more power than the retiring big boy steam giants. GE and GE. GE's engineers, many fresh from wartime jet engine projects, saw an opportunity to rewrite the rules. Instead of adding more cylinders or stacking more diesel engines, they proposed a radical leap, mount a jet engine on rails. The first prototype, numbered 50, rolled out in 1949. It was an experiment in every sense, a proof that gas turbines, built for aircraft, could move freight across the continent. The early results were promising but modest, with horsepower ratings still trailing the big boys. General Electric kept refining the idea, pushing through two more generations of turbines. Each round brought more power, better reliability, and bigger ambitions. By 1958, the third generation arrived. These new locomotives, quickly nicknamed Big Blows, delivered a staggering 8,500 horsepower per three unit set. That figure stood unmatched anywhere in North America. The design paired a massive turbine with a pair of support units and a fuel tender large enough for 24,000 gallons. The turbine itself was a marvel. A GE Frame 5 simple cycle engine, adapted from stationary power plants and bristling with innovations. 16 compressor stages, 10 combustion chambers, and enough thrust to push mile-long trains over the Rockies without breaking stride. Project leads at GE, men like John Neeling and the legendary turbine specialist Joseph B. McKee, poured over blueprints, test logs, and metallurgical reports. They solved problems nobody had faced before. How to keep bunker sea oil hot enough to flow. How to channel exhaust at 850 degrees Fahrenheit. How to keep turbine blades from warping under relentless load. Factory test reports showed the turbines could maintain peak output for hours, shrugging off the kind of punishment that would sideline a diesel. For a brief moment, it looked like the future of American railroading had arrived. Delivered not by incremental improvement, but by a bold bet on the raw power of jet age engineering. Union Pacific's finance department spent the better part of a decade chasing numbers that, at first glance, looked unbeatable. Bunker C oil, the fuel behind the turbine's thunder, was a refinery leftover, thick, sticky, and nearly worthless to most industries in the early 1950s. At times, a barrel cost less than a dollar. By volume, railroads could buy it for two to four cents a gallon, a fraction of what diesel fetched. For a railroad moving millions of tons across the West, those pennies added up to real savings. But Bunker C did not flow like diesel. It arrived in the tender as a cold, black sludge. It was so viscous, it had to be coaxed through pipes with steam coils and kept at a steady 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Each turbine set carried a 24,000 gallon tank and the heating system ran constantly, even when the locomotive sat idle. The fuel's quirks required extra maintenance, more careful handling, and a steady supply of steam. Still, as long as Bunker C stayed cheap, the math worked. Union Pacific's cost analysts tracked every penny. Internal memos from the finance office compared the price of Bunker C to diesel fuel noting that turbines burned twice as much per mile but still came out ahead, so long as the oil remained a waste product. The calculations were so favorable that, for a time, the railroad could afford to overlook the fuel's drawbacks and the extra work it demanded. The entire gamble rested on the assumption that Bunker C would stay in the bargain bin, ignored by everyone else. By the early 1960s, the first signs of trouble appeared in industry bulletins. Chemical manufacturers and the plastics industry began eyeing Bunker C as a feedstock, driving up demand. Finance officers flagged the price creep in quarterly reports, but the turbines kept running. The economics that once looked bulletproof were starting to look fragile, their advantage slipping away with every uptick in the price of oil. Heat radiated from the turbines in ways that defied ordinary experience. Inside the engine, Combustion reached 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit, 
hot enough to melt aluminum. Exhaust temperatures measured 850 degrees as gases blasted from the stack at 150 miles per hour. A jet of invisible force that could lift hats and scatter debris along the right of way. For maintenance crews, these numbers were not just figures in a manual. They meant real risk. Shop staff logged burns from touching handrails that had absorbed stray heat. And field notes warned of scorched ballast where the exhaust lingered too long. The turbine's nickname, Bird Cooker, was not a joke among railroaders. Engineers recounted seeing flocks drawn toward the shimmering plume, only to fall mid-flight after crossing the superheated stream. Union Pacific maintenance logs from 1959 to 1963 list avian remains as a recurring cleanup item. There was no official count, but the evidence collected along the tracks told its own story. Standing trackside, the heat could be felt before the train even arrived. Asphalt near overpasses sometimes softened, and the air shimmered with distortion. Crews learned to time starts and throttle ups to avoid damaging nearby roads or causing accidental fires. Safety briefings included reminders to keep clear of the exhaust path, and engineers wore heavy gloves even on summer days. Inside the cab, windows stayed closed against the noise and heat, but nothing could keep out the sense of danger. The turbine's roar and the physical force of its exhaust created an environment closer to an airport runway than a traditional railroad. For those who worked with these machines, the extremes of heat and velocity were never abstract. They were daily hazards, written into every shift and every maintenance report. Inside the cab of a Union Pacific turbine, conversation was out of the question. The roar drowned out every word, so engineers and firemen relied on a silent language of hand signals and head nods. Crewmen joked that the only thing louder than the turbine was the air horn, until the day management moved the horn from the cab roof to the radiator section. The official reason was to prevent ice buildup, but the real benefit was that the crew could finally hear themselves think, at least when the turbine idled. The noise was only part of the ordeal. Every shift brought new hazards. In tunnels, the turbines had a habit of flaming out, starved for oxygen in the confined space. One moment, there would be a steady thunder. The next, silence and darkness. Crews described the sudden stillness as unnerving, a train coasting blind through a smoke-filled tube, lungs burning, hoping the consist would roll far enough to catch fresh air. Maintenance logs from Echo Canyon and Weber tunnels in 1963 list multiple incidents, some ending with hospital visits for smoke inhalation. The turbines did not just challenge human endurance, they threatened city infrastructure. Near Ogden, Utah, the Riverdale Road overpass became infamous among local road crews. In June 1961, a turbine idled too long beneath the span, and the exhaust at 850 degrees Fahrenheit softened the asphalt. By the time the train moved, the road surface sagged and blistered, requiring thousands of dollars in emergency repairs. After that, engineers were ordered to time their starts and throttle ups to avoid melting pavement. Ogden's municipal logs detail the incident down to the repair bill, $4,200 in 1961 dollars, all charged back to the railroad. For everyone involved, from engineers to city workers, the turbines demanded constant adaptation. Each fix, whether moving a horn or rewriting a timetable, was a reminder that brute force on rails came with a price, measured not just in dollars, but in daily improvisation and risk. By 1963, Union Pacific's gas turbine fleet had reached a scale that no other railroad could match. 55 turbines, each with the power of a small power plant, hauled freight across the open west. At their peak, these locomotives moved more than 10% of all Union Pacific's freight tonnage, millions of tons rolling between Council Bluffs, Cheyenne, and Ogden behind a thunder that could be heard for miles. Operations managers tracked every consist from their desks in Omaha, 
watching as the turbines conquered grades that once stalled the best diesels and steam. Train sheets from dispatchers show mile-long consists, sometimes weighing over 10,000 tons, pulled at speed by a single turbine set. The numbers on the board told a story of brute force and efficiency, fewer breakdowns, fewer helper engines, and faster turnarounds. For a brief window, the experiment paid off. Union Pacific's turbine fleet delivered the kind of performance that other railroads could only envy, a triumph of engineering and logistics that seemed for a moment to have solved the railroad's greatest challenge. Midway through the 1960s, Union Pacific's finance board gathered around a set of quarterly reports that read like a warning flare. Bunker C Oil, once a refinery cast-off sold for pennies, had become a hot commodity. The plastics industry, hungry for cheap feedstock, was buying up every barrel it could find. Within a few short years, the price of Bunker C jumped from under $1 to nearly $3 a barrel. Internal memos tracked the spike, a five-fold increase between 1963 and 1967, wiping out the cost advantage that had justified the turbines in the first place. Minutes from a 1967 finance meeting spelled it out clearly. Fuel cost now matched or exceeded diesel, but the turbines still burned twice as much per mile and demanded extra maintenance. The numbers no longer worked. What had started as an unbeatable economic gamble collapsed under the weight of a market the railroad could not control. The fate of the entire fleet, once tied to the promise of cheap fuel, was now sealed by an industry that had never cared about trains at all. December 26, 1969 started like any other winter day on the Cheyenne to North Platte line. But for the crew assigned to Turbine 7, it was anything but routine. The engineer, a veteran who had spent years learning, learning to read the machine's moods by vibration and pressure gauge, knew this would be the last time he would throttle up the most powerful locomotive in America. The train rolled out under a pale sky, the turbine whistling to life, echoing across the empty plains. Dispatchers logged the consist as usual. A quiet understanding settled over the crew. This was the end of the line for a generation of brute force engineering. By February 1970, Union Pacific's retirement directive swept through the fleet. Shop crews drained the last of the Bunker Sea oil, and the turbines fell silent. Most were cut up for scrap, their hulking frames reduced to memory almost overnight. Out of 55, only two incomplete shells avoided the torch. UP-18 now rests at the Illinois Railway Museum, and UP-26 at the Utah State Railroad Museum. Both stand stripped of their turbines, silent and inert. Reminders of a time when power was measured in decibels and tons hauled. Museum curators catalog what is left, but for the men who ran them, the memory of that final run lingers. A thunder that faded as quickly as it arrived. Cities still wrestle with balancing innovation and livability. Today, noise pollution ranks among the World Health Organization's top environmental health risks, impacting millions in urban corridors worldwide. What we build for progress can also reshape the boundaries of what is acceptable to endure. The engines of change are never silent. The true cost is measured in what we are willing to live with. Share your thoughts below.